The effect of the fertilizer agents phosphorus and nitrogen on algal growth and blooms. I was really interested in algae, and I found that King County puts out data gathered from lake monitoring buoys in nearby lakes, including Lake Washington. I downloaded the data for the past couple of years to look at some of the trends of different characteristics that the buoys monitor, including levels of chlorophyll, which gives a rough estimate of the algae concentration and water temperature. I'd assumed that algal growth was directly correlated to water temperature, but the graphs I created from 2011 and 2012 data show that the peak chlorophyll levels and water temperature are not aligned. The same is true for the 2009 and 2010 graphs. So clearly there are other factors that affect algae growth, and I decided to research algal growth and blooms. Algae blooms are a natural phenomenon. After rapid growth in a population of algae, or an algae bloom, the algae die and are fed on by bacteria, whose respiration then depletes the water of oxygen. If the oxygen is depleted enough, the water can no longer support animals, and it is known as a hypoxic zone, or a dead zone. The United Nations reported that the number of dead zones around the world has doubled every 10 years since 1960, and one study found that almost half the lakes in the United States are in less than good condition as a result of an overabundance of nutrients. So I chose to research the effect that two nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, have on the growth of algae in Lake Washington. I am to examine how varying levels of fertilizer, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, affect algal growth. I hypothesized that all the lake water samples with added fertilizer would experience more growth than, than the control because there would be additional nutrients to support the algae. I predicted that the dishes with a tenth the median amount of nitrogen and a tenth the median amount of phosphorus would have the most algal growth, followed closely by the dishes with a median amount of one nutrient and one hundredth the median of the other. However, I pred predicted that the dishes with ten times of one nutrient and zero of the other would experience less algal growth because, although there would be plenty of one nutrient, the lack of the other would be a limiting factor for the growth of the algae. I wanted to explore a broad range of dilutions because I had no knowledge of which conditions would support maximum algal growth, and I also wondered if there was a certain threshold where too much fertilizer could be detrimental to the algae. I ultimately created five different dilution combinations that span from having no phosphorus or no nitrogen to about 10 times the median amount of those nutrients in urban runoff. The first table shows the amount of phosphoric acid and sodium nitrate I added as a multiple of the median amount in urban runoff, which is 1x. The second table shows what those values actually are. On the left is a picture of a plankton net, and to the right is a diagram of my algae net. Essentially, my net is just made up of two pantyhose legs that are stretched around wire rings. The wire rings keep the nets open and are used to attach the nets to the yardstick with binder clips. Because it's on a yardstick, I can walk along a dock and drag the net underwater to collect algae. Once I had created the dilutions and gathered a sample of lake water with a high density of algae, I was ready to begin the experiment. I added 30 milliliters of the lake water I collected into each of my 12 petri dishes. Then I added fertilizer. To do so, I used a micropipette to measure one milliliter of the corresponding sodium nitrate and phosphoric acid solutions, and I mixed it into the petri dish. After adding the fertilizer, I used a hemocytometer to count the initial number of algae in each petri dish because I had no way of maintaining the exact concentration of algae in each dish's wa lake water. A hemocytometer is a microscope slide that has tiny etched markings of squares in the glass. So under a microscope at 100 times magnification, I counted the number of algae that fell into a specific area, which gave me an estimate of the overall concentration of algae. However, the size of the sample for a hemocytometer is so small that it isn't necessarily very accurate. In order to get a more representative sample and a more accurate understanding of the concentration of algae in each dish, I always took five separate drops of lake water for each dish and averaged the hemocytometer counts for each one. Then, every 24 hours, I took another count of the algae to track its growth. I found that all the water samples with added fertilizer 
experienced more algae growth than those without. Within the samples of added fertilizer, increased phosphorus led to more algal growth than increased nitrogen. And, contrary to my hypothesis, the samples with a tenth of the median amount of phosphorus and a tenth of the median amount of nitrogen did not experience the maximum growth. In fact, they had some of the least growth of all samples with added fertilizer. This is a table that shows the results of all 240 algae counts I took with a hemocytometer. Looking at the range of values, it's clear why I needed to take multiple counts and average them together. The average range in the five hemocytometer counts for the same petri dish on the same day is about 6.625, which is quite significant. These first graphs show the growth of the algae in each dish over the duration of the four counts. I averaged the values in the trials to create this single graph. You can see that while the control, which has no phosphorus and no nitrogen added, began the experiment with algae counts in the middle of the data, by the end of the experiment, it had lower counts of algae than all the petri dishes with fertilizer added. This suggests that the fertilizer, including both nitrogen and phosphorus, led to increased algae growth. But perhaps a clearer way to understand the algae growth is by comparing each setup to the control. In this graph, I average the two trials and show the algae growth as a percent increase or decrease from the control. It carries the same information as the previous graphs, but simply displays it in a different way. For example, the fact that all the setups with some level of added fertilizer had more growth at the end of the experiment than the control is related in this graph by the fact that all those setups have positive percent growth rates. In the final count, we see that the 0.01x phosphorus and 1x nitrogen has the largest algae concentration at 145% growth from the control, whereas the 0x phosphorus and 10x nitrogen has the smallest algae concentration at only 32% growth from the control. However, the large algae concentration for the 0.01x phosphorus and 1x nitrogen is in part due to a single outlying hemocytometer count. On one of the final counts from my first trial of that sample, I found a filamentous species of algae which had about 40 algae cells attached together, which I counted as 40 separate algae, contributing to this very large algae count you can see here. The strand of algae happened to fall under my sample, small sample for the hemocytometer and be included in the count. However, excluding that specific algae count, my final values would look like this. In this graph, the final algae counts follow a clear division where increased phosphorus levels correlate to increased algal growth, with the exception of the 10x phosphorus and 0x nitrogen sample, which falls just below the sample with 1x phosphorus and 0.01x nitrogen. I was correct in hypothesizing that some amounts of both nutrients are required for maximum algal growth. However, contrary to my hypothesis, the water sample with the same low amount of phosphorus and nitrogen did not have the most growth. Instead, I found that increased phosphorus supports more algal growth than increased nitrogen. But no matter what, the growth of the algae was capped in my experiment. Increased nitrogen and phosphorus can increase algal growth, but they're not the only nutrients that algae need. My algae were kept in small dishes of lake water that I couldn't replace during the course of the experiment which would replenish the other nutrients necessary for algal growth. As a result, the population couldn't have grown past a certain threshold due to the lack of other nutrients that I didn't focus on. Even so, I found that the addition of nitrogen and particularly phosphorus can greatly affect the algae population and therefore the health of Lake Washington. And it is important to understand how we harm the ecology of the lake by adding these excess nutrients through sewage and fertilizer runoff. Thanks for watching.